so we did one of these about one month ago, and there is a lot more nerdy content inside of it. Like we talk about GDP trends. We talk about the unemployment rate, um, number of days anchored at sea outside of the L.A. port, the amount of dry powder, liquid cash that's on the sidelines. So there was a bunch of encouraging things that we dissected in the in the presentation that we did at the end of March. And if you haven't seen that, it might be worth going back and watching it or ask my office and we'll send it to you. Um, but that, that presentation ended with all of this is great, but inflation is the 800 pound gorilla in the room and the effects of inflation supersede all of those positive things that optimists are trying to point at inside the market. So um, this presentation is going to be a little less content filled, but I promise um, it'll be of use. And, and what's been on my mind on Wednesday, I reached out to Nikki and I said, we got to do a webinar. We got to be out in front in front of the people uh, we work with just so they can go into the weekend with a little more peace of mind. Um, this market pullback we're in the midst of right now, it just feels different. It, it just feels like the beginning of, uh, of a recession. It doesn't feel like 2008 or COVID, but it just seems like uh, I visited with a, a client today and, and his remark was, it just seems like every day there's another you know, shoe dropping. So um, we're going to talk today about um, what's going on in the market, what we're doing to protect you and, and hopefully give you a little peace of mind that um, this isn't the end of the world. Here's our compliance slide. That's a really important one. Uh, give everyone a minute to read that and keep me in the good graces of Paige. Um, all right. So I, I put this slide together this morning. So all the numbers are about 2% worse if you saw what's going on with the stock market today. Year to date, the S&P 500 is down around 12%, probably darn near 14 with what's occurred today. The uh, NASDAQ, mainly tech stocks, are down around 20% year to date, probably 22 and what's made this pullback a little bit different from some of the ones we've experienced in, in recent history is typically bonds have an inverse relationship with stocks. So if the stock market crashes, usually bonds are going to perform a little bit better. Um, not this time around, right? So we've literally watched the bond aggregate index, AGG, it's down around 10%. And the only reason Netflix is quoted on this slide is because it just so happens to hold the crown as the absolute worst investment in the S&P 500 year to date. How would you like to be a Netflix executive loaded up with Netflix stock and watch 70% of your wealth disappear um, because of this most recent market pullback? So it's been a very, very challenging environment, especially for the prototypical 60-40 investor. You know, the person who puts 60% of their money in stocks and 40% of their money in bonds, uh, you know that that's not our style. What we typically prefer is um, having a bedrock of stability. We like to use fixed and linked instruments to kind of safeguard a portfolio against interest rate risk and as well as um, stock market risk. Um, but I think of like our SWAN model, for instance. Our SWAN model is a 100% market-driven portfolio, whereas if certain sectors of the S&P 500 turn off, they get shifted into bonds. So go go figure, you get out of the stock market, which is down 12%, you go into the bond market, which is down 10%. Now, luckily, we sprinkled in some gold and silver and um, treasury inflation protected securities, I-bonds in there, which have, which have held up a little bit better. But it's been an incredibly challenging time to, to have money at the expense of, of capital markets. And, and the other thing that's been goofy about this year, we're looking at the market right here under a very you know, short lens. But if you remember in January, when everything boiled over in Ukraine, the stock market crashed, we were down darn near 15%. And, and then things started to kind of get back, be a little more encouraging. We, we realized that, hey, that war in Ukraine, the, the, the Ukrainians dig their heels in and and this might last for, gosh, decades, perhaps. Um, so the market kind of rebound, but now we're, we're back to selling off again. And these chops along the way make it even more challenging as a money manager because it's hard to deploy money into, into different um, asset classes when 
when things are so darn erratic and it's red across the whole board. Usually there's a bull market someplace where you can go, hey, that's where you can at least make a buck in this market. Um, but with all of that said, you, if you work with us, you don't subscribe to that 60-40 methodology. You don't have all of your money in stocks and bonds. So your portfolio is built for this type of environment. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of the things that we've done in the past, what we're going to continue to do going forward. And hopefully give you a little peace of mind that, albeit a very challenging market, uh, there's a way to invest your money and, and still yet get a little sleep at night. So people will always ask me, they'll say, they'll say Adam, are, are we in a recession? And I, I think it's kind of a silly question because a recession is technically a, a, a dictionary term for two quarters of negative GDP growth, right? So my question is, are we in a recession while the GDP growth is on the downfall? Or are we in a recession after some Federal Reserve chairperson declares that we're officially in a recession? If you ask me, I think we're in the midst of a recession right now, and it's been driven by inflation. If you look at our inflation numbers right now, if we were to use the same exact calculation that they used in the late 1970s, early 1980s, to gauge inflation, the level of inflation that we're experiencing right now would be higher than that of the late 70s to early 80s Jimmy Carter era. And if you remember, what the Federal Reserve did to combat that inflation was they rose interest rates to historically high levels. We're in a bit of a pickle there because we didn't have $29 trillion deficit back then. If we raise interest rates too high, right now, our debt service payments only represent about 3% of GDP, but you know, what if interest rates go up to you know, 5 6 7%? I've already seen the 30-year fixed mortgage start to creep up to around uh, 6%. So I like this little cartoon. Obviously, someone did it in Canada, but everyone is worried about COVID, but no one is worried about the ancillary effects and the domino effects of the things that we did during COVID, mainly print money and distribute it via a helicopter and dilute our currency by 40%. So I happen to think we already are in a recession. Um, recessions aren't when someone flicks a light switch and goes, okay, it's a recession. Now everyone run for the exit. The economy is a living, breathing, multifaceted com instrument that has so many different moving parts to it. And technically the term recession is purely GDP. And if anything tells you about GDP growth, um, it's got to be Amazon's quarterly numbers they released yesterday. They released these after the close. Amazon came out and said that, and of course, Amazon, if you ever look at the, the percentage of market share, 60% of all retail activity, I'm talking everything, like toilet paper, hand soap, all the way up to like higher computers. 60% of retail business occurs on Amazon's platform. And they came out yesterday and they said retail sales are down 10%. I think that's a heck of a lot more telling about economic activity than the Federal Reserve or the Treasury releasing some report where we don't have a tremendous amount of trust in the numbers that they're disseminating to the general public these days. It seems like they're political activists more so than uh, bean counters. But Amazon's not allowed to do that. Amazon's got shareholders they need to report to every quarter. They represent 60% of retail activity, and they were down 10%. Go figure that stock is down around 15% today because of that. I did a podcast yesterday with some guys who were in the business of um, freight and uh, logistics, whether it be shipping stuff across the ocean or throwing it on a truck and uh, bringing it to the middle of America. And one of the things that they said to me, they said a bunch of things. So listen to that podcast. It just got released on all the different platforms today. Couple, couple hot takes though. What do you think America's number one export is? I was on a conference call with a bunch of nerdy financial people and they were like, soybeans, electric cars, jet airlines. America's number one export is empty containers 
and garbage. Isn't that troubling when you think about that? Our number one export is an empty container to get shipped back to another country so they can ship more crap into our country. And what the takeaway from our conversation was the shipping lanes and the ports have all the supply chain has kind of freed up there. But now the pickle that we're in is the trucks. They're running out of chassis to deliver the, the, the containers to their end user. And a lot of the end users um, over purchased during COVID because they were worried about getting raw materials and products. So it's almost like a, a garden hose when you cinch it off and then you start it back up. Water's going to spurt out like on a rocket ship. So there's a run on chassis. So if you drive by any of the terminals, and he said this to me and it didn't register until I actually did this. If you drive by any of the port terminals, you'll notice that the containers are stacked higher than they've ever been stacked. You'll never see it this high. In fact, he told me that they can only stack about seven high before they crumble. Another little fun fact you can share with your friends. Um, but these guys said to me that we're on the front lines of the American economy. Our clients are, are retailers, distributors, and truck drivers. And these are the people, this is the pulse of the American economy. And they said that our orders are down around 20% right now. And this is someone in Charleston, mind you, you know, one of the most bustling economies in the whole country. So they echoed what I'm saying. We're already in a recession. No, someone just hasn't declared it yet. Right? We haven't had um, Jerome Powell tell us it yet. But you're in a recession and it has been driven by inflation. Tune into that podcast. You might take something away from it. So what do we do as investors, as retirees? Because some of you are sitting there going, this is my worst nightmare. I just retired. And now we're going to have this ugly recession where you can't make any money in the capital markets. Um, and I'm going to run out of money. And it's, you know, a country song. Well, I, I think of this lady that you're looking at right there. Two ladies, actually. So Claire's grandma, who we simply call grandma, her name is Mary, and she's the namesake for my little girl, Mary Kate, um, just turned 99 years old on Thursday. So you got to believe this woman has lived through a few recessions in her time. Heck, she was born before the Great Depression. So I know a lot of you go, I'm a child of the Great Depression, and you were born in 1946. Well, uh, not, not, not you. You were a child of a child of the Great Depression. This woman actually lived through the darn Great Depression. So I think there's a few things we can learn from her. Someone who's probably lived in her 99 years through about 12 to 15 very real recessions. So here goes. What would grandma do? Keep it simple. Keep it safe. I like Dave Ramsey's always saying investment advice your grandma would give you. But then he tells everyone to put all their money in growth mutual funds, which are down 20% year to date. Don't get me wrong. I love Dave Ramsey, but Dave Ramsey's got a big old megaphone on a massive mountain and he talks to millions of people. Some of those people are 20. Some of them are 70. My little megaphones talking to people who are 50 to 70 years old and are on retirement's doorstep or in retirement. So, we're seeing fixed and linked rates right now that are higher than I've seen throughout my whole career. And they just keep getting higher and higher. And I did a little YouTube video that talked about the cost of waiting. Cause I think some people are going like, Oh, darn it, Adam. I bought one uh, three months ago and I, I only locked in at you know, 3% or I only locked in at 2.8%. Well, if you mathematically game out the fact that you locked in that rate, at a hair lower, the fact that your money was deployed and in compounding interest for the few months before the new rate came in, you're still better for having deployed your money, even though it's a, it's a lower rate. But the rates just keep going up. These are for, uh, you're looking at fixed annuities right now. We'll start to see this with CDs, but for whatever reason, the banks are behind the curve here. If you go to a nerd wallet or bank rate, CD rates are just like not um, remotely close to 
what we're seeing from the insurance companies. You can see three years at 3.15%, five years at 3.6%. When we talked about linked rates, we're talking about market linked CDs, fixed indexed annuities, fixed index annuities, 50% participation rates, annual caps, uh, darn near 7%, I think I saw the other day. Um, I bonds, you got like a day left to buy your 20 year I bonds and lock in at 7%. There's kind of a, a, a sweet spot right now with I bonds. Now, of course, they only limit you to 10,000 per husband and wife. Um, and you got to buy them through Treasury Direct and you got like a day to do that. Um, if you work with us, most all of you have gobs of money in Treasury inflation protected securities, which are I bonds in essence, but you can buy more of them. Um, but we're seeing incredibly strong fixed rates right now. And I'd argue, and what our advisor are, are, are going to be are, are going to be doing in your planning with you is, why on earth would we own a bond ETF or a bond mutual fund where the yield is two percent per year, and if interest rates go up, you can lose principal, and it's a pretty, you know, certain phenomenon that interest rates are going to go up when you can just lock in an instrument at three percent or three and a half percent and have zero interest rate risk so there's no risk of your principal going down in value so i know people hear the a word annuity and they and they they kind of cross their fingers like it's a vampire and, and many times for good reason but when we're talking about a fixed annuity we're, we're talking about something very comparable to a cd obviously there's a whole you know different legal reserve system backing it up. But um, we're not talking about like a long-term annuity contract with all kinds of bells and whistles that have fees associated with them. We're just talking about a little holding bucket where you have some certainty, simple, straightforward, secure growth. So I like to think that's something grandma would tell us to do. Keep it simple, keep it safe. And if you've got money in cash, mind you, you are losing money exponentially safely because of the inflation numbers that have been registering. So figure out ways to deploy that money in things. General Patton's old saying, forward, always forward. I never want to retreat and pay for the same real estate twice. It's too expensive. So you you, you want to um, – uh, I, I, I saw Nikki pop up there. I think she didn't know it. But um, you, you want to invest in things that are – consistently moving the ball down the field. And, and here are some options um, that we like. What about this one of grandma? Invest in high quality comfort food. Grandma caught wind. Anytime when I first started dating Claire, I would, I would go visit grandma. And I asked Claire, I said, does grandma eat anything other than pie? And I, I know I just butchered that with my Yankee, my Yankee accent, but pie. Everything was pie. It was tomato pie, chicken pie, sweet potato pie, comfort food. And grandma caught wind that I ate a um, macaroni and cheese. And every time I went to grandma's house, she would just load me up with macaroni and cheese. So high quality comfort food. There's my boys. They go visit grandma at Daniel Point. And they have a soft serve ice cream machine and they just load up and then don't go to bed till 10 o'clock at night. Um but grandma thinks it's the funniest thing ever, as you can tell by her face here. High quality comfort food stocks are dividend producing stocks. I pulled this chart from an email Frank sent me earlier this week. We were contemplating putting a different, we were contemplating getting rid of preferred stocks and a high yield bond fund because they were both down like 10%. So Frank said, well, why don't we put this, this other dividend fund in there? And my response was, well, what the heck makes it so different than all the other dividend funds that are in there? Because we, it, I like it when certain investments zig when the market zags. It's, it's the, the theory behind diversification. You don't want everything working in the same direction. But most all of our portfolios are, are loaded up with dividend stocks. This is a year-to-date chart on these various dividend stocks. You can see many of which are up in value, and the ones that are down in value are only down three, four percent compared to the stock market down, you know, twelve to twenty-two percent. So 
when and then of course while you own these dividend stocks our dividend driver model right now i think last i checked has a yield of about 4.7 4.8 percent so if you're worried about the market crashing but you need retirement income well put your money in dividends and ride it out if the stock market drops another 10 20 percent sure you're, you're not going to want to sit there and frame your statement and, and and gloat about it because you're going to see red on your statement but it shouldn't perform as poorly as like a tech stock and all the while that's simply a paper loss because it only registers as a real loss if you click the sell button so we're very very bullish on dividend stocks this has been a i've been echoing this for about a year and a half now we've been slowly pushing your portfolios to have a heavier emphasis on dividends uh and now it's it's paying paying dividends because of it um but if you're watching this and you're like, hey, you know, um, I think I should have more dividends or I don't like the idea of owning Amazon, Apple and Google, which are all down 20 percent. I, I don't like seeing the red on my statement. Um, you might want to you might want to overweight dividends even more. We love them. I think it's comfort food for investors. And when we buy dividend portfolios, we're investing your money, not just in like one limited partnership that pays a 10 10% 10, 10 yield. We're investing your money across probably 500 different companies that all have shown a track record for paying a dividend, increasing a dividend, like dividend, dividend aristocrat companies that have increased their dividend for 25 years in a row. So these are high quality, cash heavy comfort food type names we love dividend investing right now here's another thing that i've learned from grandma um go bargain shopping and, and one other thing about grandma about buying high quality she'll pull out like an umbrella that she bought back in 1970 and talk about how she got it at like a woolworths or something like the woman appreciates quality whereas now if you buy an umbrella, you kind of buy that umbrella knowing darn well that it's going to last you like until the first windstorm and then you'll have to throw it in the trash. Um, so different era where craftsmanship and quality was uh, honored a little bit more. So now that, you know, Claire and I are yuppies and we like to go to all the new fancy restaurants and uh, we want to spoil grandma because, you know, she's the family's matriarch. Um, and we offer grandma, hey, let's go to Husk or let's go to Hall's Chop House or let's go to this fancy restaurant. Grandma's happy place is a salmon salad from O'Charlie's. So the woman knows a good bargain when she sees one. And I might argue that there are some bargains right about now in the market. If your greed glands are going and you're going, hey, I got some cash, I got some dry powder. And uh, never let a bad a catastrophe go to waste. We created a model. This is probably the newest model that we, we've created. And we're, we're calling it our turbo model. And it's a good thing we just created it. Because had we created it like four months ago, the thing would be down darn near 30%. You can see one of the biggest holdings inside of it is Kathy Wood's ARC fund. ARC is down darn near 60% over the last year, down 40% year to date. But this thing has in it a lot of the areas of the market that are the most downtrodden, right? Like financial technology, uh, blockchain technology, private equity companies, the metaverse, um, uh, private lending, real estate deals, semiconductors, microchip manufacturers. Um, what else is in here? There's a sprinkle of commodities in there as well. So if if you're looking at this market right now, like like Netflix is down 70%, um, PayPal, look at the chart on PayPal, look at NVIDIA down, a uh, big manu uh, semi semiconductor manufacturer here in the United States, down darn near 40%. Facebook, Metaverse is down 40%. There are some stocks that are beyond correction territory. They are in full-fledged bear market, look out below um, capitulation territory. 
So here again, I prefer hunting with grenades rather than arrows, right? Because if you hunt with an arrow and you go, Adam, I think uh, Netflix is uh, going to springboard back up, you're kind of catching a falling knife. And Lord knows I've done that with Kathy Woods' fund. That's an investment that I've been putting some of my own personal money in. And, you know, I thought it was on sale a month ago and it was 20% higher then. So when you start trying to bargain shop in market time, you run the risk of catching a falling knife. And when you catch a falling knife, you either might get poked or you might grab it where the, the blade is. So just know that going into it. So long as you look at this market through the right lens, you can scoop up some wonderful businesses that are down 30 to 50% over the, over the last three, four months. And I don't think that's a bad idea to do with cash. But if you're expecting them to pop back up 20, 30% in the next month, you might be in for a rude awakening. Although I will tell you, this is going to be a very active summer. Google announced they're splitting. Um, Amazon's going to be splitting. And even though stock splits have nothing to do with market valuations, for whatever reason, they cause retail investors to, to swoon. They get excited about stock splits. So I would imagine in June, I think, is when those splits are going to happen. We're going to see a lot of uh, retail stock uh, baby day trader activity. So that'll bode well for a lot of the names inside uh, electric vehicles are in there. So that'll bode well for a lot of the names that you see right here on this slide in our in our brand new turbo model. So if you're one of the individuals out there who's looking at this as an opportunity going, hey, I want to do some bargain shopping. I'm not afraid of this market. I, I'd rather like double down on my risk assets. Um, this is an option. You can see how I've gone full spectrum. For some of you, it's going to make sense to put your money in something that's going to make three and a half percent. But for some of you, you're going to say, hey, this is my moment to, to scoop up deals and I want to go full throttle and make 20 percent. So grandma said this to me the other day. She said, utilize the most advanced financial technology, artificial intelligence technology to ensure your portfolio's risk profile is optimally balanced with your personal investor temperament. Um. I don't think grandma said that, but it's on the internet now, so it lives in infamy. Uh, clearly, that was not a real quote from grandma, but I thought it was cute. This is her idea of technolo technological advancement. This is her walker that Ben and Brooks play on like it's a jungle gym. And this thing's lean and mean. It's got all kinds of ergonomic seating options and brakes. And uh, I don't think grandma owns a computer. She does have a cell phone. She's got a big jitterbug. Um so, of course, grandma didn't say this, but we use this financial technology. And this is an investment that we've made as a firm that I would invite you all to engage with. So we we purchased some technology that we're going to be unrolling. A lot of you who've been in for reviews in the last few weeks might have already gone through it. Um, I would... I would invite you to raise your hand and say, Adam, I'd like to test drive this. But basically what it is, it's a it's a pretty straightforward questionnaire. It's about six, seven question questionnaire that gauges your investor temperament or your aversion to risk. And then it assigns you a score, right? So if you say, hey, I've got a negative outlook on the market. If my investments were to drop 10%, I would panic and sell. I'd rather have a guaranteed rate of return of 5% and, and, and have a, a certainty rather than play this game. And it's going to produce a score that, that represents your appetite for risk. Then what we do is we actually run your portfolio through the software. The software um, Monte Carlo's out every single market condition that would transpire with the portfolio that you have. If interest rates went up, if we ran through a recession, if there was a tech crash, if there was a subprime crash, uh, and then it assigns your portfolio a score. And then you can lay those two numbers next to each other and determine, is my portfolio built for me? Did I make the investment decisions that are synonymous with the way in which I see the world and the way in which I, I, I see my investments? And I think... By going through that exercise, a couple things might come of it. One, which I've been seeing with a lot of people, is their portfolio is even more conservative than 
how they'd like to see their investments. So those might be individuals where we go, hey, let's sprinkle some money in this little turbo model and take advantage of this pullback because you are being overly cautious um, as it relates to the, the way in which you see the market. Then some individuals might have been seduced by a bull market. They might have said, "Hey, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm been fat and happy and sassy over the last several years because, you know, with exception of what's happened with COVID, where the market went down and then it popped right back up in the matter of months, I've been making some great rates of return on all things in the stock market. So you grow overweight market-driven investments, and." Um, if you watched the last webinar we did, we showed you some numbers from Vanguard and, and like I said, Schwab and JP Morgan echoed it. Most of the big asset managers are, are kind of cooling everyone off saying, I wouldn't anticipate the same types of returns from the stock market that you've grown accustomed to over the last 10 years. In fact, Vanguard only anticipates U.S. equities to go up two to four percent per year over the next ten years. These are this is one of the most bearish outlooks they've ever had. And Vanguard is by and large a very bullish market buy and hang on for dear life type sentiment usually coming out of them. And even they're saying that the market's not going to be as strong uh, as we've as we've um, grown accustomed to. So I'd invite you all, we're going to be reaching out to you, but it's kind of first come, first serve. If you're watching this and you go, yeah, I'd like to go through that exercise, um, just raise your hand, maybe make a, a comment or email us. And, and Denai is really um, walking people through this process. So she'll get in your ear, walk you through the questionnaire, show you how you're invested, and maybe make some just thoughtful tweaks. Maybe push more of your money into dividend stocks. Maybe do some bargain shopping. Maybe, and even if your accounts are down, you know, I did a review today and the individual I sat with, one of their largest investments was a Vanguard growth fund. It's actually one of the largest investments we own as a firm. And, and this thing has been a rocket ship. It owns Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA, PayPal. And it's been averaging about 16% per year. Last year, it was up 30%. The year before, it was up 40%. Well, guess what's happened to that fund year to date? It's down 20%. So, so I was showing this to them going, oh, no, like, is, is now the point when we lick our wounds? And, and my message to them was, you know, you're still, even with what we've experienced, you have still achieved double-digit rates of return in this fund over the course of our time working together. So rest on that rather than woulda, coulda, shoulda, I wish we sold at the absolute peak and then and then bought back in at the absolute bottom. If your risk score and your portfolio are on different islands, adjustments must be made so your portfolio is behaving in a manner in which you're comfortable. So lean into us, ask about this software that we purchased. It wasn't cheap, but I think it's going to have a positive impact uh, on the people that we get to work with. Lastly, and but not least, uh, don't lose your cool or become emotional. Like I said, grandma's 99 years old. Um, every now and again, I'll ask her a question. Like one time I asked her, I said, hey, grandma, do you remember when they dropped the atomic bomb? How did you feel? And her response was, I was sad, but then I was happy. You know, you're not going to get a lot of emotion out of her. She doesn't give a rip about politics. She doesn't get worked up. She's owned AT&T stock for eons. And even though that's been a terrible stock, she focuses on her dividend. She loves collecting a dividend every quarter. And um, she's been through 15 of these things. And, and most of you, you know, are long in the tooth, you've probably been through eight of them maybe, or maybe as much as nine of them. So um, now more than ever, we don't want to let our emotions get the better of us. Your plan was designed for this. In, in working with our firm, you don't have all of your money in bonds. You don't have all of your money in Amazon and stock. 
you've got a, a balanced approach where we use a multitude of different investment strategies, right? So most all of you have money in fixed and linked accounts that have not lost a nickel. Most all of you have chunks of your portfolio in high quality comfort food, dividend producing stocks that even if they were to drop another 10, 20%, you're going to consistently get that dividend every single month that you can utilize to, to live an abundant retirement. So um, lastly, ask for our help. Another thing grandma isn't shy about doing, um, I do grandma's taxes every year. And I don't even think my parents would ask me to do their taxes just because they see how busy I am, you know, chasing kids around, running the business. She sees the crow's feet and my eyes grow deeper and my hair grow grayer. But she doesn't even think twice about saying, Adam, do my taxes or, or come over here and help me move a piece of furniture. Lean into our office. Ask us for help. Do not go to bed with negative thoughts in your head. Right. If you're if you're watching the ticker tape or you're watching some man in, uh, wearing makeup on TV, scare the daylights out of you. Use us as a sounding board. Schedule a quick phone call. I know our calendars get busy and, you know, and your calendars are busy. So getting in here for a one hour visit sometimes is is difficult or it's like pulling teeth. But there's nothing stopping you from doing a quick 15 minute call with your advisor. And if your advisor is bogged down, like I'm. I'm take it a couple days off next week, lean into someone else in our office. Our people are awesome here, guys. One company, one voice. If something's coming out of their mouth, it's it would be something that would come out of my mouth. So lean into our office, ask us for help. We have invested a tremendous amount of money in technology. We are constantly making adjustments to your portfolios that we want to shine a light on to you. So you know that the people that you elected to to work with uh, are, are, are tweaking things uh, in your best interest. So thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, let me see, Nikki, am I able to like look at the questions possibly? I don't know. Yeah, you should be able to see them over in the chat. Okay. Uh, I don't, I, for whatever I did, can you turn off the, 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 the PowerPoint? Because I can't, um, I, I did something to, I did something where I can no longer see my on the right hand side. You know how I could typically see all the stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there may be three dots on the right side to click. Oh, oh, there you go, guys. This is what Nikki has to deal with on a day by day. Let's look at some cats. Also, mine. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, gotcha, Bill. You spelt your name wrong. That wasn't on us. You did that. Uh, I'm interested in the test drive. All right. Interested, interested. I'm interested. Okay. All right. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have deny uh, get all these names who've watched this. I like how it, someone called it test drive and now it's just become test drive. Maybe that's the name we give it. Um, wow. Lots and lots and lots of people. Um, Swan. Okay. Made a comment about Swan's performance. Yeah. Swan, Swan's been challenging. I mentioned that at the beginning, uh, Floyd. Um, and, and the reason behind that is because market crashed, we got out. I was doing a victory lap in January when the market's down like 12 and we're down five. And then the market popped back up. We got back in. Right now, that portfolio is, again, nearly out. So um, I think with the activity we've seen over the last few days, I think, you know, it's it's doing its job again. But certainly, I appreciate you keeping me honest. Was Amazon market share driven high by the pandemic and now normalizing? Maybe. Maybe, but uh, heck, I don't know about you. It's, there's probably some truth to that, John. Um, I, I'm still buying just as much from Amazon as ever before, though. You only know you're in the recession after you're out of it. Yeah, that's economists are really good at driving with their rear view mirror, but not with their front windshield. How much is a swan down? Okay, so here you guys got commented on that. Okay, maybe he took off the advice, retired. Maybe he took. Uh, he took his own advice and retired. Ha ha ha. Okay. I think you guys are now commenting about, uh, when I wasn't here early. So y'all, thank you so much. Um, again, lean into the office. Let me know. Um, let me know if you got any questions from the presentation, have an excellent weekend and I look forward to talking to y'all soon.